Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bierak of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview, and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, today's special guest is a returning guest. I like having him on towards the end of every single year. He releases this comprehensive report. Uh, normally, it's a review of the previous year about to end and a preview of the year about to come. He's a chemistry professor at Cornell. Dave Colum, thank you for joining me again. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I like these conversations. We have them uh, every December, it seems, so... Uh... So, uh, so let's do it. Yeah, I think it's important. I'm a history major, and I enjoy reading about history. So I think it's important to look back at what happened so we can kind of maybe make some educated guesses about what's going to happen maybe uh, in the near term. But uh, my first question for you is uh, how would you describe what happened in 2015 then in just a couple senses? What would be the very short uh, summary then of what you think happened in 2015? Well, so as you know, I tend to look at um, sort of this odd combination of markets and geopolitics, and 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 I realize that I essentially keep a journal through the year. And and so, what did I see? Well, first of all, I found 2015, 2015 to be very confusing. Um, and part of the reason is because the, the most important events were deeply geopolitical. So you had you know, problems in Greece that came to be building to a head and then miraculously just went off the screen. Um, you had problems in the Middle East, which no one on the planet seems to understand, and, 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 and they are just getting more convoluted and more dangerous looking. And then, and then you had the markets. Um, they looked to me like they were topping out in some way. And it's, you know, you always hear the trite phrase, the markets, you know, topping out as a process, not an event. And, and if we stay within the context of that idea, then, then they look to be copping out to me. And, and you have things like the high yield debt market rolling over. And and at the same time, it, it didn't make a definitive move, right? The whole market just pretty much treaded water all year um, doing this process. And so, so um, I must admit that as the year went along, the more uh, disoriented I was. Um, trying to trying to figure out what the theme of the year was. So, and, and for me, in some sense, it was a year of of, um, of indecision, a year of confusion, and, uh, and it's a difficult year to write about, actually. So. Yeah, I find a lot of the stuff confusing as well. I'm a value investor like your friend David Einhorn. I've read a lot of value investor books, Warren Buffett, Benjamin Graham, uh, so many of the – Sir John Templeton, who's kind of a, a, a mixed value investor – but, you know, in terms of finding, like, good quality companies at reasonable valuations where there's a margin of safety and some good dividends, there's really not a lot of those. I mean, other than um, in the oil patch and some mining ones, and, you know, those yields are in jeopardy. The commodities have just gone uh, – well, this started, obviously, a while ago, the commodity bear market, especially in key commodities like precious metals. But, you know, the, the commodities bear market accelerated drastically for oil and uh, base metals in 2015. But it, it's been a very weird year in terms of it, David. I, I don't know about you. It looked to me like in August or September the market was about ready to have some type of you know major crash. I think we had almost had about 10% corrections in the major stock market indices, and then all of a sudden you know that stopped. So it it just was a weird year where I guess you know whether it's high frequency trading algorithms or or new money printing programs, covert quantitative easing, like either currency swaps or reverse repos or whatever the new money printing program is for backdoor QE, they managed to stabilize the markets, you know, and keep them in this weird trading range uh, when either they should have crashed or, or things like that. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, a lot of people could miss, I'm sure the pros did not miss it, but it would be very easy to miss the fact that in August when the market seemed to crack, um, it was not the magnitude of the corrections that was that was problematic, but rather the, the actual behavior of the markets. And so the, the markets seemed to break. And I don't mean break, meaning as in break to the downside, but I mean actually be broken and malfunction. So you had a lot of mini flash crashes. You had a lot of uh, market shutdowns. You had events that, that, that designates monitor routinely, and they said, look, that, that the markets are not functioning correctly. Um, they're, they're not liquid. They're not behaving. So, so it wasn't just the 10% correction that spooks people. That if, if if the 10% correction spooks people, they shouldn't be investing because because they don't have the spine for it. But um, 
it, it really looked like it was, the, the malfunction in the market was problematic. 1.0 Hedge did this this article, and on a single day, uh, if you add up just the triple point triple digit move up and down in one day, the market moved 4,500 points, and that's just a staggering amount of motion to finish the day roughly even, right? And so uh, that that's a uh, it's a metastable situation. It suggests that, um, that something is very unhealthy. Um, it's not a market uh, function the way market should. It's not clearing. It's not. Uh, it's not doing correct price discovery. And so, but the, as you said, they saved it. I don't know who they are. I don't know who how they <laughs> saved it. But um, somehow it, it was retrieved. Um, you, you mentioned potential bargains in in the energy sector. I. Uh, I'm not a stock picker. It's not that I have an aversion to it. I, it's, I think I lack the skill for it. And so if I picked a good stock, it probably meant I picked a good sector and just happened to, you know, draw a random stock out of the pile of that sector that I got right. So uh, I, I like the energy, but I don't think energy equities have corrected enough. If you look at the, the price of energy, how much it's dropped, I don't think the equities have dropped proportionately yet. So I'm still patiently waiting for that. I don't think uh, when the oil prices were high, the equities didn't rise to meet the higher oil prices. So there was a lot of skepticism on the upside uh, years ago, too. So, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, markets normally don't go to rational levels. So uh, there's a lot of traders right now. Uh, we've seen this in options activity that are betting. These are trend trading momentum guys. They're betting on oil, you know, at $15 apparel. I don't know how OPEC uh, governments, these governments are going to be able to survive that because they have debts, too. So you look at the, you talked about the junk bond debt. I mean, a, a large portion of that junk bond debt is in shale oil producers. This is not oil that's cheap and easy to produce and can generate uh, consistently free cash flow. Now, they have been able to lower the cost quite a bit on some of these shale wells. They've gotten better at them, but they did drill on debt, and there's huge depletion rates in the wells. So I, I, they're talking, you know, now in the mainstream about all this massive supply glut in oil, but these, a lot of the U.S. oil production is based off shale, and I think like 85% of all global oil production growth since 2007 was all based off U.S. shale oil production. You know, once that these companies start going bankrupt and we're starting to see them, you know, this could create a domino effect. Uh, this could be larger. I think there's actually, Dave, a lot of uh, potential there, there there's more black swans now in my opinion now than white swans which is it's been flipped on its head so i think you know some of the bigger ones are the emerging market countries the commodity producing countries that were reliant on higher commodity prices like oil and base metals and they borrowed an enormous amount of debt in u.s dollars and now their currencies are falling like crazy and then you have the uh the junk bond market which a lot of it is uh bad u.s shale oil debt the banks haven't written it off yet and the oil companies uh, you know, I was I was reading the financials of a few of these shale oil producers, Dave, the ones with the most debt, and they were like, oh, we lowered some costs, but oh, we're just going to borrow more debt to buy time. So I don't know how much longer this can continue, but, you know, they haven't really drastically cut the oil production yet, but it's going to happen at some point in the near future. Yeah, well, um, that's right. And so there's an irony here, though. So, so we've been talking about for for many decades, this idea of becoming energy independent. And and so here we, uh, you know, I don't believe it actually that, that we've made great progress towards it, but I think, I think we, we, we've got, we got an oil boom out of the, the shale oil with technology improved and we figure out how to get more oil than we thought we could. Um, as we progress towards, you know, some, some imitation of energy independence, maybe, um, it seemed to destroy the credit markets, and so there's a certain irony there that 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 as as we attempt to become energy independent, we destroy the very credit markets that are required to become energy independent. And so um, I don't quite know how to wrap my brain around that one, but it, it seems to be happening. Um, I have a little trouble with the glut argument. Uh, the way they measure available energy is is so dubious sometimes that that I don't know if it's a glut or if it's just that. Um, and the energy markets are so financialized now. They're so, there's so much speculation in them that has nothing to do with actually moving energy from point A to point B or drilling it or selling it, but, but just huge leverage bets. Now, we're talking about a glut. I, boy, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I, I believe that glut story. That's a convenient story, but it really comes down to the fact there's trillions of dollars you know, betting. 
And I think that's what's unwinding in a very big way. Now, the other thing to remember is, is it's not the junk market's not junk, junk bonds are not all energy, but as energy tanks and as the companies start defaulting and redemptions start appearing, um, the, the, the fund managers will have to sell things that they can sell, not what they want to sell. They'd love to get rid of the energy at this point, but, but they're not liquid anymore. And so, so to the extent that there is a, another non-commodity-based junk bond market, it's going to get destroyed because it's got to be sold off. And, and then it'll start to leak into the not-so-junky sectors of the bond market, into the corporate bond market. And there's already stresses appearing there. And, and and the redemptions will start appearing there. And, and that's how the cascades, the contagions start. It starts in some pocket, you know, some Russian bond default, and then it goes from there. So so I to think that it's contained to the commodity markets, that would be a that would be that would be a mistake. A very big mistake to assume it's contained to the commodity markets. Oh yeah. It's it's definitely not contained because I mean Ben Bernanke was on I think CNBC in 2006 saying you know subprime is contained and all this I just remember that famous interview you know where he said oh housing prices never fall our models blah 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 and <laughs> subprime is contained but yeah I agree with you about the the uh, oil supply glut you know we see these uh, articles on Zero Hedge talking about the tankers that are docked but you know even if there's a hundred million barrels of extra oil. I mean, the globe is consuming over 90 million barrels of oil per day. So that globally, that that glut in quotes, right? It right. can be used fair. It can be used very quickly, unless you know China is building like a billion, a couple billion barrels of strategic petroleum reserves to go uh, put the oil, you know, and hide it and save it up for uh, the future. Uh, we don't see that. Uh, so I mean, these tankers, maybe they hold a couple million barrels each, or 10 million barrels, or something. That, in the whole scheme of things, for the global oil market, where reserves are not being replaced, and the, the market's not thinking about reserves being replaced now. We've had so much capex cut and things like that. Uh, uh, honestly, man, uh, because of the momentum traders, there's just so much paper oil out there, Dave. And this is a problem we see with the gold and silver markets with paper futures contracts too even more so than oil, but there's 25 times as many paper barrels of oil for every real barrel of oil. The oil experts I talk to say there's there's at most maybe one and a half, maybe two million barrels of uh, supply glut in quotes, oversupply. And, you know, that's the only like 2%, at most 2% of the, you know, total market of an oversupply. That's not justifiable for this price dropping like that. So there has to be some other factors. I think there was, you know, a lot of geopolitical games played uh, either against Iran or the U.S. asked the uh, Saudis to not cut production to maybe uh, hurt Russia or things like that. I think there was a lot of geopolitical games that started the downtrend in oil that broke that up key support level and it's just cascaded from there. But we're getting to irrational levels in the oil market where, you know, if, if ExxonMobil starts to fall, I mean, or some of these if we do have a large oil company go bankrupt, like maybe Petrobras or some of these others, the banks that hold those notes, they're in trouble. Maybe pension funds that have investments in these companies, they're in trouble. So there's going to be, you know, a domino effect. Yeah, and uh, and that gets back to the question of the bond market in general, since interest rates are at, at multi-century highs in at least some sectors. Uh, excuse me, uh, prices are at multi-century highs. Interest rates are at multi-century lows. Um, I've, I've all along felt that when that renormalizes to to uh, to uh, um, uh, prices and, and interest rates that that actually represent a real return, not just a not just a place to hold money at zero return, um, the, there's got to be carnage. The, the bond market is the is the 500 pound gorilla in the room, and now they've they've, they've squeezed every last penny they can out of, uh, out of the capital gains in the bond market. And now it's it's got to reset. Someone's got to shake the extra sketch. And I think the energy market's just the proximate trigger. I think the I think the, the unraveling, the the deleveraging, um, which which is again at nosebleed levels of leverage, um, it's going to hit the corporate bond market. And there's already hints of that. Um, the most, the one that sort of jumped out at me and was fairly recent is a, an article that described how um, banks are demanding collateral for corporate loans, which are being used to to pay dividends and to do share buybacks. And when the banks are demanding collateral, it means they're starting to get nervous. And and when when companies have to start putting up collateral, maybe they'll just deleverage. Maybe they'll maybe they'll not borrow the money. Maybe they'll not. 
um, do the corporate buybacks with leverage, which are a disaster in the making anyway. So that, that's no love loss there. Um, but then the corporate bond market goes. And then, then, then the question is what next? You know, it's, people continue to make capital gains on treasuries. But but again, it's just driving the interest rates to, to ridiculously low levels. So the best case scenario is if if if, if you know you're sitting on a ten year bond in the pace, what two percent round numbers we'll call it, um, you're gonna make ten percent over the next two yeah, percent over the next ten years, right? That's what you're gonna make. And and if it's not that, then it's probably gonna be something less than that because you're probably gonna get your butt kicked in the in your bond fund. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, I think there's a lot of flight capital coming in from emerging markets and other countries into the United States because the United States is perceived as safer. The dollar, the U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury markets are perceived as safer. The emerging market debt, I think that's besides just the, the junk bonds and the shale oil debt, uh, the emerging market debt. Those, those things could go very bad very quickly. We've had devaluations in Brazil and many other countries of their currencies, rapid ones. And a lot of these countries have histories, you know, of defaulting on their debt. So the markets, you know, over the last six years, seven years, when uh, commodity prices were high, the Wall Street banks were all too eager to give these guys massive amounts of debt, you know, with the high commodity prices just and the strong, strengthening currencies justifying that and not looking at their past history of, you know, potential defaults and things like that. Because I think Brazil has hyperinflated, I believe, five or six times since the 1940s. So they've had, you know, a history of every couple decades having massive currency and, and debt crisis, uh, bond crises and things like that. Uh, I think that's another potential black swan. But it, uh, I, my next question for you, though, is, is about interest rates. You know, the Fed obviously did this one token interest rate increase. Do you think uh, they plotted out that they could uh, do a number of them more, maybe up to 1.4 percent? Do you think the Fed's going to keep tr keep going this path? Well, so I have a bimodal view of the Fed. And the one is that they seem to be the phrase that he's coming up with is pusillanimous, which is cowardly. Um, and and they 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 shock me in their unwillingness to take a, a risk to their. They're, they're worried about their credibility, and at the same time, by doing so, they're destroying their credibility, in my opinion. So this is not a, a Paul Volcker Fed. This is a much wimpier one. Um, on the other hand, the Fed has a history of, of a, at times shocking the markets with with their strength of will and with their willingness to, to curb speculation, with their willingness to let markets you know fall like a house of cards. And, and so, uh, despite a few decades now of, of the Fed's catering to the market's needs, it's, it's conceivable someone's going to grow a spine. And and if they start marching rates up, you know, even if it's a quarter of a point at a time, we know what happened back in, in 06 when they started marching them up. I think it was 06 they started. It didn't take long before the, the, the market broke. And the minute the market realizes that the Fed is going to march the rates up until they break, until something breaks, then, then something's going to break pretty soon thereafter, right, because the the speculators will head to the door very, very quickly, and a lot of carry trades will unwind very quickly. And yeah. on the other hand, you know, so I don't know. I don't know which Fed's going to show up this time. If it's just the wimpy Fed, then um, then then I'd have your inflation hedges in place. I know no one sees inflation. I, I see I see a, a, an odd mix of inflation and deflation all rolled up into one gigantic incomprehensible ball where, where things will go up and things will go down. And cool. all I know is by the end, we'll, we'll all be hurting pretty badly, I think. Well, I, I'm an Austrian school economist, Dave, as you know, and I've, I've actually seen a lot of inflation. The monetary base has just exploded the base money supply. But um, as von Mises and Murray Rothbard said in many of their writings, that inflation, it hasn't, there is obviously some inflation in consumer prices with health care and rent and some food and things like that. But the majority of where that inflation has gone, it's gone into asset prices. And the Wall Street people, the Keynesians, I'm sure the people that David Einhorn has to deal with and your other Wall Street friends, you know, the ones who say there is no inflation, a lot of those guys who are trained at, you know, uh, Ivy League schools in economics or business schools and things like that, and, uh, you know, they memorize their textbooks and got A's, you know, they're, they don't count. Maybe it's because of their job and they make so much money and, and bonuses when the asset prices go up and they pick winning stocks, but they don't seem to count asset price inflation as inflation. Um, 
I know Einhorn does. Uh, <laughs> he's a smart guy. Uh, I think there's a lot more who who understand that than 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 let on, right? Their jobs depend on them being out there. I I couldn't manage money right now. I mean, I wouldn't know how to manage money now because because I would be heading to cash and my clients would be saying, "Why are you going to cash?" and they'd pull their cash and and so I, you know, the smarter I got, the more I started looking like Michael Berry and and in, in the big short, right? And 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 people wouldn't want anything to do with me. So um, I'm sympathetic to the guys who manage money. I haven't had a terrible year. Uh, I view that as a bad sign when the smart guys are having a bad year. That means the dumb guys are having a good year. And um, and I think the, I think the highly leveraged money right now is the dumb money. And other things that bother me to no end are things like risk parity bond funds. These are bond funds that are attempting to get high returns. They're, they're reaching for yield with leverage now. And, and the guys who, who promote it are endorse it with enthusiasm. I say, well, you get equity like return by just leveraging up. And even Citigroup said in their, their annual outlook at the beginning of the year said, hey, you know, things look good, lever up. And I'm going, a major bank just said to lever up. Are you kidding me? And so, yeah, this will, I think this will unwind. Uh, if you look at valuation models, whether you look at the Tobin skew or whether you look at Buffett's price to GDP or you look at the Robert Schiller's, you know, sort of 10-year average PE ratios, which is the only one we're looking at if you're going to use PE, they all show uh, a round number about the same, about a 40% correction to get to the mean and the of course, much more than 40% if you regress through the mean, which you really should. And so um, I'm very cash rich. I intend to stay cash rich. I've got a plan to get out of my cash position, um, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to put it put it into action until the time is right. I'm going to be I mean, like in that movie Braveheart, where they wait to pick up the spears right to the last second when the, the opposing troops are eye to eye, and then uh, then I'll hopefully pull the trigger when when things look pretty bleak and uh, I like I would like to get out of this personal money management game altogether. I'd like to buy some some global index fund and just park on it for the rest of my life. That would be great. Well, uh, unfortunately, Dave, I think I think the intervention of all these central bankers they're going to create very unstable markets. This is we're all living in a live uh, science experiment thanks to the Keynesian economics and the interventionists and and uh, all these politicians that are forcing all this money spent that uh, no one can afford. I mean, there's just a global debt problem. You talked about it earlier with the oil. Why are we uh, – oil companies are inherently risky. You know, they might not find the oil. They could find the oil. It could cost a lot more. Why are they drilling on debt? Why did they spend all this money – uh, all the, why were they given all this debt to use oil when in the past we know for a fact that there's an old adage in the oil industry that you don't drill on debt? But yet, you know, everyone just keeps getting more debt, whether it's student loan debt or auto uh, subprime auto auto loans or all these extra things are just getting more and more debt. And a debt we've we had a global debt problem, you know, 2008. That's what we learned from it. Hopefully, well, the people who are uh, who woke up in 2008 or understood why 2008 was happening. They understood there was a global debt problem, but the people in power have tried to solve the debt problem with more debt. So, But one thing I can expect going forward, Dave, is uh, unfortunately I expect a lot more volatility going forward up and down in these markets. So, you know, you talked about the intraday movements, these high-frequency trading programs and algorithms and things. They They intentionally – add extra volatility to markets where there shouldn't be any, and they make extra money off the trading volume. They get rebates from the exchanges, and basically they commit crimes, and the exchanges allow them to get away with it because the exchanges are also making more money off of it. But there, there are so many instances where uh, I think you know, in 2015 we saw volatility increasing. Obviously, in commodities, there was massive volatility, but we started to see volatility come back in the regular asset price markets. Uh, especially the stock market crush and other things. I think going forward now, as these central banks, you know, run out of ways to inject liquidity into the system, we're going to, or try to experiment with rate raises and things. I think we're going to see volatility increase across the board, which, um, you know, if you're an options trader, it's good. If you know how to buy puts and calls and, and uh, straddles and strangles and all these other callers and all these other options, it's good. But if you're not sophisticated like that, if you just, if you're a buy and hold type of investor or you're putting your money into your 401k or IRA, it's going to be frustrating for, for a person like that. Well, it's going to be frustrating for a person like that. That will be me, by the way. Um, 
because uh, the other thing I won't do is I won't make a bet that I can't forgive myself for making. And so, uh, so you know, I've had a number of ideas through the years that, that would have paid out well, but um, if they hadn't played out well, I wouldn't have said, hey, that was a good idea nonetheless. I can live with that. But if I, if I if I go and do some wild and crazy bet, some harebrained scheme, and I get duped, um, I, that, that would that would be the sin for me. So so um, so I I attempt to make decisions that I can accept the failures. I, the, the successes are easy to accept. It's the failures that I that I ask if this fails, what will I be saying to myself? And if I say, hey, you know, it was a good bet, then 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 I'm fine. So. Um, Right now, I'm fine with cash. And people say, well, how can you sit on cash and make enough? I say, well, ah, the S&P guys didn't make anything this year either. Yeah, I, so, I just you. And, and the other thing to remember is, this is something that's easy to forget. Those of us who've been in the commodities for a long time, um, and I'm not a commodity investor. I you know, I had to learn about, about just the idea of investing in things that were commodity rich equities back in, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, the, 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 the bottom line is if you were just some indexer, you invested in something that mimicked the XLE or something similar to that, you're up threefold on the S&P. So despite the beating, you still, as a commodity, as an energy commodity investor, you're still way ahead of that person if you didn't jump on the tail end of the thing or either got in early. And so, um, so I'm not losing a lot of sleep over this one. Yeah, I actually learned about commodity investing, I think, in 2008. I read Jim Rogers' book, Hot Commodities, which got me very interested about commodities. Uh, it's, it, he's, he's a very uh, interesting speaker, and it's, it's good to learn from someone like that. Well, so I was interested in commodities back around oh one and and I, I I couldn't find a way to do it rationally. I mean you can find the equities, but I aside from something else, so the the Rogers uh raw materials fund, the commodity fund, um had just started and I talked to the guy who was Rogers partner, I and mean, Clyde not gonna come to me, Clyde Harrison maybe. Um for about an hour and a half, and I talked to one of the, the guys who actually marketed the fund for about another hour and a half, and I, I walked from it. I said, no, there's something about this. It's all done with options. It's all done to track the prices of commodities, But but uh, and and I eventually walked from it, and I, I never looked back from that. I, I was one of those I wouldn't forgive myself if I got into it and got duped. So I just went into you know general energy and general material funds back in 0102. It's because I was having so much trouble finding a way to do it. It convinced me that that that, that it was it was not a terrible idea. Um, that right now I'm trying to figure out how to get, how to invest in Russia. There's not a lot of options there either that are very good. So if I could find someone I really trusted to be able to get into Russia and invest, I'd I'd start thinking about. It. I'm not ready yet because. Because I think we're gonna have a global washout, but but when the, the dust is settling and, and it's time to, to try to get back in the pool, uh, Russia, um, Persia, you know, Iran, places like that, um, they interest me as specialized bets. But this global ind- indices, I I I, I, I want to bet on the growth of the globe at some point, and uh, might be a bad bet. And if it's a bad bet, we're in trouble anyways, right? Yeah, I mean the the emerging markets, uh, they will they will eventually start to recover. They'll they'll deal with their debt problems one way or another, and there will be a recovery. You know, they they do have emerging middle classes, unlike the developed world, uh, and they will be consuming more commodities over the long term. Although uh, China pulled decades and decades of copper and base metal demand forward for infrastructure and fit, fixed asset programs that really uh, you know would have taken 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years maybe to build. Uh, in a more rational, non-centrally planned economy. Now, in, in your uh, 2015 review, you talk about the war on cash. Uh, we've seen some examples of that in smaller amounts of areas. We've seen uh, certain types of capital controls in the United States, whether that's FACTA, FACTA, or FATCA, depending upon how you want to abbreviate it. Uh, what, what, uh, do, do you think then this is going to be the new normal now going forward is going to be the war on cash? Yes. Um, it already, it, we've already lost in the sense that you can't just walk into a bank and they got 10000 without them alerting the authorities. 
And to the extent that you are at serious risk of an asset seizure by the authorities, and that's, you know, this, to, to some of us who read about the asset, the civil asset seizures, it sounds like a uh, conspiracy theory. It is so well documented. There, the asset seizures now, they're, they are estimating that, that police seizing assets of people who have not been charged with a crime now exceed the assets seized by burglary. <laughs> so, so the cops are now exceeding the burglars for, for, for asset seizures. And, and, and so I, I can't risk taking cash out of the bank because I've got a lot of assets to seize. And, and that's a terrible situation. So now I can't, I can't go to cash, cash. I can't go totally to cash. The, the risk is way too high. And so in that sense, we've lost the war on cash. Now, if we ever get to the point where there's no cash, like they've done in, I think it's Sweden, they just went to it, um, all of a sudden you're going you're gonna to say, look, every penny I own is registered in some portion of the banking system, right? There's not a penny in your wallet, not a penny in your pocket. And then, and then the, the question I would ask the, the people who think cashless society is good is, what are you going to do when the banks put in a 4% surcharge or a 5% surcharge or a 6%? How are you you're going to have no defense against that kind of action? They can take any quantity of money they want. If they do it collectively, they will simply take your money. And the only defense against that is cash or hard assets. Dave, what, why do you think then they're, the governments are doing this war on cash? Is it so, you know, if you're a rebel rouser, if you have a good radio show or podcast, they can, uh, they can threaten to remove you from the financial system? Uh, are they trying to, cash, uh, trying to tax the people then that are uh, outside the economy, that, they're, that are in the gray economy, you know, construction workers or people in other professions like babysitters or others that are, that are all cash businesses and working off the books? Uh, uh, do you think there's a lot of reasons why then this uh, war in cash is occurring and uh, increasing then? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure those are reasons. I think those are excuses. Um, I think the reason is that the banking system would love to control every penny. And, and they're essentially plugging all the holes. And so if everyone's stuck in a cashless society, then the banking system now is completely dominant globally. There's no escape route. And so, um, so the, the banks will, you know, you'll get, you know, you'll read articles about how, how a cashless society is important because, you know, drug runners use cash and bad guys use cash. And then so somewhere in the middle of the article will say, by the way, it also cash makes it very hard to have looser monetary policy. And you go, that's the money line right there. That's what they're really talking about. They're really talking about negative interest rates and, 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 and forcing our, forcing us to play the game because you, you can't go negative. You can't put surcharges on cash if it's in your silly claustrophobic, right? That, there's no way to do that. And so, um, you know, the defenses are to buy material goods, right? This is, this is a classic protection mechanism. What does that mean? Well, Bitcoin certainly draws fire. I'm not a Bitcoin fan because, again, I don't understand it. It might be fantastic. I'm not a detractor. I just know that if I put money into Bitcoin and lost it all, I'd never forgive myself. Uh, gold, I have no problem with because because gold's got such a long history. And, and, um, and it's kind of a tail hedge, uh, but I don't think it's just a tail. This is not a one in a thousand hedge that I'm hedging with gold. I I think that possibility the central bankers destroy the system for all intents and purposes is pretty high. And I'll tell you, if you live in Venezuela right now or a number of other countries owning gold look awfully smart. And we've got central bankers who seem to be willing to risk everything to achieve to achieve goals that they perceive, maybe they perceive them to be correct and, and admirable, but but I think they're idiots. I, I and, and I don't use the word idiot lightly. The reason I think they're idiots is because I think it takes an idiot to believe that you should control a system that complex through a committee, through through that kind of decision making instead of letting price discovery. I think it takes a, a special kind of a moronic um, cockiness to think that a committee can set the price of capital. Uh, Soviets tried to do it, it didn't work. And it's not gonna work for us either. And I think it's a fool. I think it's a fool who buys that model. And I've just offended, you know, a billion people probably, but or not, because we probably are not getting a billion listening. But um, 
No, I think it's fool, foolishness of a higher order. And, and they're determined to have their way, so I'm determined to try to fight them. Yeah, I'm not a fan of central planning either. I think uh, the larger scale central planning is tried, the more it tends to fail. And, you know, there's lots of evidence of this throughout history the last uh, 100, 150 years or so, whether it's China, the Soviet Union, and uh, many other examples of that were, you know, full communism uh, have failed. And uh, then we go back and, you know, the, the thing is this mixed model or the Keynesians say, oh, you know, we can't have a free market in interest rates or money or things like that. And even, you know, Milton Freeman, who claimed to be a libertarian, it was the, the money and interest rates and the money supply was the one thing he wouldn't let the market set when he claimed to be, you know, a hardcore libertarian. So it's, it's just confusing to me. But all, all these things that we see now with with uh, the war on cash, it's all adding up to, you know, a totalitarian state, in my opinion, where they want full control of your lives, what they can tell you and what not to. Jeffrey Tucker put out this great piece about how the Republicans and Democrats are combining to take more uh, of your rights away, civil liberties and monetary rights and all these things away. Uh, now, you, you teach at a uh, Ivy League school at Cornell. It's obviously, I'm sure, pretty progressive. Uh, what's your opinion then on the lack of freedom of speech then, uh, all these uh, – all these progressives that are out there, whether they're professors or students who are trying to get people to vote to, re to suspend the freedom of speech and other rights on campuses then? Well, as you know, I wrote a lot about it. Um, what I can first tell you is, is I haven't seen a lot of evidence at Cornell of this, this, this stemming of freedom of speech. I see, I see political correctness, no question about it, but there's no question that the, uh, that the faculty are, is, are largely is comprised of largely uh, left-leaning people, um, um, but but I, I I couldn't go through a, a litany of things that Cornell's done that's that, that's represented a mistake. Cornell was in the news a bit this year, but it was silly little things. It was you know gotcha journalism where someone walked into a, 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 a some administrator's office and had a camera on him without the administrator knowing and got the administrator to act like an idiot. That's like, well, yeah, that's easy to do. Like, that's like a David Letterman man on the street series of interviews. Um, I do worry about what, what Cornell might do. I, I, I terribly worry about, um, about uh, uh, oppressive thought, thought um, police on campuses. And I think, I think, I think that there's people gaining power on campuses who are who are causing um, minds to close very very quickly and, and causing rational people to fear reprisal if they speak out. And and this comes in under the Title IX problem where you know in theory talking on this interview someone gets a hold of this they said well you know a column speaking out this much against some of these ideas out of the Title IX and Fraction, and they could they could come at me, and and all I can tell you is I'm, they're going to carry me out on a board um, before I give in. But um, but I, you know I haven't seen it yet at Cornell, but I read about it. I, I I wrote about it. There's there's isolated events on campuses. There's young men who are being treated very poorly. Um, due process is not applied to them when it comes to you know accusations of sexual misconduct, which heaven only knows what they did wrong, but in the essence of data, you can't prosecute, but colleges seem to be willing to do so anyway. And I, that to me is a staggering, staggering oblivion to due process when you, when you convict a guy without data. Um, it doesn't matter what you think could have happened. It matters what, what, what the data says. And there are schools that are doing some pretty, pretty, Treacherous and pretty wretched things. And when I see them, I call them out. Um, there's some good writers out there, some people doing a great job of calling this out. It doesn't to stop. Could be worse. I, I personally complained to the provost and to a dean and, and said, look, we have to have people with the wisdom of Solomon in these positions that, that have the potential to suppress freedom of speech. And there are other people who think like me on campus. I chat with them quite a bit. And we're in a minority. But I haven't seen anything explicitly yet at Cornell. And even these other cases like at the zoo and the film stuff, they're not as bleak as they look. The press is surrounding a fairly small number of students in a fairly small event, making a fairly large show over it. So 
I'm, I'm not sure how bad it is yet, but it, it's ominous. Ominous clouds on the horizon on college campuses. And it's getting to the point now, if you're in the wrong one, you could be in trouble. I don't know. If so, I'm likely to find myself in trouble at some point. Yeah, and we have obviously a presidential election coming up. Uh, it's now less than a year away. And, you know, Hillary Clinton looks like the front runner in the polls. It seems, you know, she has a lot of women brainwashed. Uh, that still, you know, believe in her. This is a corrupt woman. She's scandalous. I know you wrote about her in in your uh, report, uh, uh, her and her husband. And, you know, it seems that there's so many people who, who will vote for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, especially ones that have been on college campuses. And yet, you know, when, when you try to present them with the free market argument that, you know what, there's no, going to be no uh, you have mass amounts of student loan debt, there's no real jobs for you, uh, not many high paying ones, although at Cornell, you know, with a Cornell degree, there may, but at a lot of other universities, there won't be. And, you know, you talk to them about the financial system and the corruption and how Hillary is like a huge crony capitalist. And a lot of these people, you know, they just shrug it off and, oh, you don't want to see a woman as the president or, you know, they just talk about the normal PC lines. It's just very frustrating uh, from the regular people who don't understand all the stuff going on in the markets and haven't woken up. There's still so many of those people. And, you know, unfortunately, I... Hillary right now is winning the polls. It, she obviously is a career felon. She should be charged. She should probably be in prison the rest of her life. And I don't even know if she's going to get charged at all, Dave. And she has a, if she doesn't get charged, I mean, the election's probably hers unless she's indicted. Well, I don't think she's going to get charged. Um, Hillary is the first politician that I've grown to detest. I, I've Got, I've had plenty of politicians that I hoped wouldn't be elected and that I disagreed with them politically. And But but Hillary, I think Hillary is a clinical sociopath. I think there's chapters in textbooks on sociopathy that describe both her and Bill. Um, I think Hillary's probably the most qualified to be president. I know that sounds weird. Um, but of all the people in terms of uh, she's a political animal, right? And that probably qualifies you. But, but I have a moral bar. And and the, below the bar, you know, everyone says, oh, they're all corrupt. Yeah, I get that. But Hillary's Hillary's another decimal point away from everybody, I think. And and there's some point where I think below below that moral bar, I, I just can't sign off in any way, shape, or form. Bill drop below it. Um, I, I think when you're president of the United States, you can't be out there womanizing. I don't think. And geez, this is not a moral judgment. This is just one of he's the president of the goddamn United States. He has to behave himself at some level. And everyone says, oh, the president of France. As I said, I don't care about the president of France. So Bill, by doing the things he did, he undermined his presidency. He put it at great risk, and I think he should have been removed. Um, just like if he was the CEO of any of 500, Fortune 500 companies, he would have been removed in a heartbeat. All 500 companies would have fired Bill Clinton if he was their CEO. But somehow in his position as president of the United States, we do not. Now, back to Hillary, uh, her capacity to fundraise in, in things ways that I think are profoundly illegal um, and profoundly gluttonous and profoundly, I, I put it on the edge of treason, possibly way over the edge of treason. Um, I, I don't see how you support her now. If for some reason you support her views, then I say, okay, I think you're misguided, but I get it. If if you're simply voting for her because you're a social justice warrior and you think that getting a woman in the position is more important than anything else, then, then go ahead and sell your soul, but that's what you're doing. I, I have no respect for you because you're not processing information. You're not you're you're simply voting on some absurd concept of of, of a specific genetic makeup of the president of the United States. And, and I don't buy it. I think you're a bit of an idiot if you, if you think that way. And, you know, again, I probably just offended 60% of the women in the country, but if, if, if you, if you're voting just because she's a woman, um, is that any, is that any better than voting for, for Romney just because he's a white guy? No, it's not. And, and, and they're voting against Obama just because he's a black guy. No, it's not. It's not a valid thought process and so process Hillary's record uh, it's wretched in my opinion and I don't think she should be president because of that so um, you I write you, about it it's, it's you know drives me nuts you made, you made some great points there but when I uh, unfortunately uh, 
in the voting process and also in investing in a lot of processes, the human brain, it doesn't always go through the rational decision, decision making process. It tends to stick to big, powerful emotions. And a lot of the Hillary supporters, as you know, I live right outside of Washington, D.C., and there's a lot of them here. When I just try to bring up, you know, any of the bad things she's done to them, and they just say, well, oh, you don't want to see a woman be president. And I was like, well, I would love for a qualified woman to be president. Uh, and she could run on her merits and things like that. Hillary's a criminal. She's a career felon. Look at all the different things she's done to get Bill, you know, uh, as president and get him in his political career and Benghazi and so many other things. You know, they just say, oh, Fox News made it up. <laughs> oh, Fox News made it up. Oh, the Republicans are out to get her. It's, you know, the, the old Hillary line, the right wing conspiracy, and they just eat it up. They say, oh, you know, if a man did this, he wouldn't be in trouble at all. And it's it's just very frustrating. You know, we live in a society like this now where it's so PC that, uh, you know, someone says a bunch of BS and, you know, you can't be honest with them what you really think. You have to keep your mouth shut because there's other people listening. And, you know, it's a it's a tyranny of the majority where the majority is, you know, they want to there's a lot of women out there, American women who want to see a female president and they think Hillary has the best shot. And that's why it says she's winning the polls. I mean, obviously, on policies and things like that, she sucks. <laughs> well, so I'm a detractor of Fox News. I don't, I don't, I don't want to listen to any news that has a political agenda of such depth that, that Fox has. Uh, I know they all lean one way or the other, but I want, I want to think that they're trying to get it right. But I don't think Fox is. I come from the right side of libertarianism, so, so I, I ought to have some inclination to support the Fox guys, but I don't. Um, I, you know, just to defend my personal self against it, I, I've been a, and this appalls fairly right wing characters who I know, but I've been a, a, a supporter of Elizabeth Warren. I don't think she's as bad as the right says. Um, I think she's an honest person. I think the attacks on her are a bit feeble. You know, the whole American Indian thing, who cares? Um, and so I would gladly support for her. If you want to elect a female president, support Carly Fiorina, support, you know, there's, you've had opportunities. I, I'm guessing Hillary supporters did not vote for um, McCain to get Sarah Palin in there as VP, right? What do you bet? That's an easy well, one. Definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. And so, so, so it, it, um, so it, to, to each their own, but, but I, I think you're selling your soul and, and it's, it's, um, I, I was no, I didn't vote for George Bush. I voted for George Jr. the first time and not the second. Um, George Sr. was fine. He was a classic old school politician and he, he worked fine. And, and, um, and, uh, I was a Reagan Republican in my, my youth and, uh, you know, not, not formally. I just voted for him, but, uh, um, but I, 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 I don't for Elizabeth Warren. I, I don't have an opposition to Bernie Sanders. He's a socialist, for Christ's sake. But I certainly don't support his socialism. But I, I think he's an honest guy. I think he, in theory, is trying to get it right, although I think he's actually just playing with him more. I don't think he's actually really trying. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I, I think Donald Trump is a very scary-looking guy. Um, but I do totally understand why the why he's got a big support because people are so fed up with with the establishment crowd that they like the idea of a guy who completely completely rejects conventional wisdom in both style and and in substance. Um, so I understand why the the Trump crowd is supporting Trump. Very dangerous candidate. Can you imagine Trump facing off against some? Some foul, do you really trust him not to pull the trigger prematurely? I, I don't. Um, well, he, seems, he seems like he could go rogue on us pretty fast. Yeah, he's very polarizing, and, you know, he, he seems to have a very big ego that if anyone, you know, pisses off his ego, he's, he tends to go after them. You know, obviously with name-calling and things, that's one thing. But, yeah, if he's in control of the nukes, uh, <laughs> that's a scary thought. But, you know, Hillary in control of the nukes is, is a very scary thought, too. So unfortunately, though, David, you know, I wrote uh, a 2016 preview as well. And I, I think, you know, as of right now, unless Hillary is actually indicted, uh, I think it's going to be the two choices for the mainstream are going to be Hillary against Trump uh, as of right that'll now. That'll at least be entertaining, right? That'll be entertaining. Oh, yeah. Now, well, here's, here's what I'm watching for. I'm watching for a mysterious reason that Trump has to drop out. And if, if, if Trump seems to be doing fine, sort of the way Howard Dean was doing fine, 
and then and then all of a sudden disappears from the scene. I'm going to know that it was all a sham, which which I tend to think anyways. It's not like we really get to choose candidates. Um, well, but if Trump disappears, you know, some health problems, some who knows what it is, then I'm going to know that his whole purpose was to, to disrupt the Republicans so that Hillary can get elected. That'll be my yeah, I mean, that, that'll be my working model if he disappears mysteriously. Yeah, it's an interesting theory. I've heard it elsewhere. You know, Trump Trump may end up causing the Republican Party to schism. It was already headed down that path, but the Republican Party may split up into a couple of different parties, two or three different parties, because the Republicans, unlike the Democrats, they obviously disagree with each other, the Democrats do, but they tend to, around election times, organize each other better and vote along party lines better, but the Republicans tend to, you know, not uh, – not be as organized as well and not to, you know, protect each other and vote that way. Not that that's a good thing, but, um, you know, the Republican Party is just losing votes due to social engineering and so many other policies from the universities and mainstream media, in my opinion. But it's it's going to be a really crazy election year. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a scary thought to think of Hillary and uh, Hillary versus Trump. Did you actually know, David, that Trump prior to 2009, I think Trump was a registered Democrat yeah. and he actually gave a lot of money to the Clintons. So the Trump Trump's used uh, uh, the Trump family used to be very close with the Clintons, uh, I guess, until recently for this election. Yeah. Um, when he first showed up and started to make progress, the rumor was that he was there as a disruptor for the Clintons as opposed to against the Clintons. So. Uh, time will tell. I, I, I think it's possible that that's true, and at the same time, he's still now a threat to her because because the one thing we know about Trump is he's a narcissist, right? And so he n- now that he's a front runner, which must shock him as much as anybody. Um, now that he's a front runner, I don't think he can not fight this with with everything he's got because he would love to put the Trump name on the White House. So um, so I, I think he'll fight an honest fight from here on out. Um, and and I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's weird. It's you know he's a bit of a risk of being a demagogue, and that's that's. Um, well, he has so um, much grassroots. Trump has so much grassroots support. You know, at his rallies, normal Republicans are tend to be pretty boring. Obviously, Rand Paul's not, but the other Republican groups, a lot of them hardly have any people show up at their rallies. Trump, when he has you know his political uh, campaigns and rallies, he has lots of people show up. So the he has a lot of passionate followers. And I think Hillary controls, you know, the largest demographic block of voters in the United States, which is the um, the American the American progressive woman. It's a large group of voters. Hillary's basically got massive majority control over that uh, in the United States of that voting block. But my last uh, question for you, before I let you go, has to do with the geopolitics you wrote about. You talked about the Middle East and other parts in your report. Uh, do you think then that these are going to be, you know, potential destabilizations or things like that? Or obviously we're seeing a lot of refugees going to Europe, and there's a lot of arguments over whether they should be let into United into the United States. Uh, what do you think maybe is going to happen in 2016 with this uh, stuff coming out of Syria and the Middle East? Um, well, that gets into very tricky territory. Uh, I think that the refugee crisis could be the event of the year. I, I try to write a and, you know, I try to piece together the story as a web of connections. So to pull, pull from that, from that mental construct to pull out an event as a singular thing makes no sense. But, but if, if there is an event of 2016, that flood of refugees across the border into Europe is, is certainly a candidate for it. Um, there's something like 1.5 million Syrians, mostly Syrian males in their 20s. I'm told. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I believe that because because there's a huge amount of propaganda behind this, so I know that the images are showing that, but I fear that that's an orchestrated propaganda campaign. But let's let's, let's go with that one for the time being. Um, these guys are going to be living in the dead of winter, no housing, source of food is unclear. Um, they are, they're not going to be the most pro-Western crowd to ever immigrate, right? Um, most people who come to the United States who came through Ellis Island came here because they desperately want to be here. These guys ended up in Europe very much against their will, very angry, caused by social upheaval in their country that was instigated by Western powers. And so their level of anger is almost unimaginable, is my guess. And so um, I tweeted something the other night about it, something very innocuous, and some woman said, I, I'm, I'm, 
in such I can't remember what town it was, a small town and she says she says it's changed completely and that you walk through town and, and there's sort of idle, you know, groups of Syrian men standing on the street corner with just nothing to do. And I, that 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 you know, it's they don't have to be evil for that to be dangerous. They just have to be young men without jobs and hope. And so I think that's a real problem. I think that's a, and, and if it's as big a problem as it could be, we'll know by spring. This is not going to be a long, drawn out one. It, this winter is going to be a bad situation if it's as bad as I think it could be. And then, uh, and you know, we've got we've got jets from all sorts of different countries strafing the Middle East from opposing teams, and you've got you've got Turkish jets, and you've got You've got you've got um, you've got Russians and, and, and U.S. troops and, and and this is a gigantic game of chicken and all we need is a screw up for this to turn into a real conflagration. So, so I view that as a as an accident waiting to happen to and hopefully nothing will happen. Um, but you know, it, it, World War One started out essentially as a bar fight, right? And and you know, some are you gotcha. Excuse me, you don't start global conflagrations over an archduke getting popped, right? And yet it did. And and there was almost no warning. So the World War One, the House of Commons had a meeting fourteen days before it started. And, and and in the minutes there was not a single mention of geopolitical risk in the minutes of the House of Commons. So they didn't see it coming at all. Someone cracked a bottle over the bar and smashed it over someone's head. Next thing you know, it's a, it's a brawl and a half. It's a pan-European brawl. And so um, so these things happen. I, I worry about them. This year was confusing because of the dominance of geopolitics. A lot easier to analyze the bond market than geopolitics. So, um, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm not, I, I have no special wisdom on geopolitics. That's, that is a guarantee. So I'm just watching in awe. I, I do know one old adage that has worked throughout history. You can cite this as the economy worsens in Europe. The economy is not good. The United States, the economy is not good. Uh, politicians and the other people, you know, the powers that be, the, the political and economic elites, you know, as the real economy gets worse and they can't hide the data as well, you know, they're going to look for ways to take people's mind off how bad the economy is. They're going to blame yeah. it on foreigners. You know, I've always, I've never known whether that's a premeditated decision. In some cases, I'm sure it is, but in other cases, I think it just happens and seems seems like a convenient description. I, I never know whether people at the top say, "Let's start a war to cover up our our, our to cover up our problems." But I do think that that it represents fertile ground upon which to to start a war. I think I think that happens a lot, um, and. Um, and, 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 you know, we haven't even mentioned China, right? And if China goes through a serious downturn, it's just starting now. And, if, and you know, if it somehow stops, I don't quite know how, but if it somehow stops, then be okay. But if China gets a serious downturn, civil unrest appears in China, heaven only knows what they're going to do. They're new to this game, right? They're not capitalists for very long. And so one of these, they're going to be tested. They're going to, they're going to have to sign off on the, the ups and downs of capitalism. And they're about to have to sign well, off on the downs. Well, actually, Dave, in the whole history of China, they've been capitalists longer than anyone else. It was just, you know, the uh, the the break from capitalism from uh, the communist revolution in what 1949 up until when they started opening back up. So there was like four or five decades of of full hardcore communism, and now they're kind of where uh, there's no civil liberties and things. So the the Chinese have a long history of being good entrepreneurs and being good capitalists and things like that. Our listeners can go watch. Uh, Marco Polo on Netflix, and there's other examples of this throughout Chinese history. So many things the Chinese have invented. Yeah, but, but those uh, guys yeah. are not alive. <laughs> those Mark, uh -huh. Marco died, um, and 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 you know, there's there's still sort of a residual Maoist thinking there, and if they retreat back to that, then they'll have problems. So. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the people that have gone to certain types of universities or have made a, you know, a career for themselves in the Chinese government off or off of cronyism and things like that. But yeah, I mean, the guy in the street in China, 
I mean, he, he sees a problem in the marketplace or with a village, he solves it and makes money. There are so many examples now in China of successful Chinese entrepreneurs with uh, you know apps and software programs and starting new businesses. So the Chinese do have, at, at the grassroots level, there are a good amount of Chinese. Now, those ones tend to not be necessarily the ones you know who are making all the money off the political uh, the stuff going on in the political circles, but uh, yeah, the ones on the bottom there they have a do, do have a history. So it's it's an interesting balance. China is a very complicated country, and to label it you know all capitalism, all communism, it, it, there's a lot of mixed stuff, mixed signals going on out of China right now. But I want to thank you again for your time, Dave. I enjoyed this discussion, and uh, if our listeners want a copy of uh, your report, uh, how can they find it? Well, they can go to. Uh either zero hedge or peak prosperity dot com and uh and and um there's several things that came out. One is the, the two thousand fifteen year in review which has a subheading um scenic vistas from from Mount Stupid and there's not many people who use that phrase instead. So if you Google scenic vistas from Mount Stupid you will find it. Um I did an interview for Peak Prosperity that again showed up in Zero Hedge, and 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 that was within the last week or two. So if you just put in my name and and Peak Prosperity, you'll 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 find it. And then and then there's this odd eclectic mix of things that I've done through the years that are not chemistry that are um, if you search if you, I didn't plan this it just worked if you search on a virgin computer Dave goes rogue um, you will find a website that has just a compendium of of year and reviews from the past and Russia Today interviews and stuff from the Wall Street Journal, stuff like that. Um, that, that is my hobby stuff that, that, that disappeared. And I'll, I'll have this other stuff uploaded there too soon. Uh, as soon as my students get back, they run the website. Um, but anyway, if you can, if, you, if someone with average Google skills can find it. I just want to thank you again for your time. I want to wish you a happy new year. Uh, hopefully, hopefully for your investments, 2016 is better than 2015 since I know you have gold and some gold and gold miners. And uh, for our listeners out there who uh, want to get a free copy of our 2015 review and 2016 preview with some investing and trading ideas in there, it will be available probably the first week of January. They can go to the wallstreetformeanstreet.com website and give us your email. And uh, they can get, they will get a free copy of the report when it comes out that uh, Mo DeWood and I have written. So uh, thank you again for your time, Dave, and a uh, happy new year. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here.